morning. If you want to learn what Gnosticism is, you have to analyze the term. It actually means knowledge by experience. So in the Gnostic's mind, you would get quote unquote saved by experiencing something. But another component is that these people have always claimed that there is a deeper understanding hidden in the Bible. And this is what I want to talk about today. Um, <clears throat> when you want to get down to the bottom of the real dispute um, from the New Testament writings, um, then you find out that it essentially has to do with who Jesus is. Has he pre-existed before he became a man? If he did, who was he? Where did he come from? And then most central though, and this is not really found in debates, um, what was the makeup of his body? Did he have several essences or natures? So <clears throat> you come to understand when you listen to debates between Trinitarian apologists, for example, James White or Bruce Reeves, and then, you know, other people like, for example, Roger Perkins, who is a Oneness Pentecostal, or um, Sean Finnegan as a Unitarian, you know, or even Muslims, that essentially it boils down to a few passages that Trinitarian apologists refer to in a manner that they say a certain insight is hidden in these passages that point towards a Trinitarian understanding of the Godhead. And what's important for you to learn is that uh, Trinity does not mean that God is one person and somehow three persons. This would be qualified as a heresy called modalism by Trinitarian apologists. So if you would really confess, yes, I believe in the Trinity, you would have to go by the definition, which is that they are actually three persons that aren't one person at the same time, but it's three persons that share one essence. They call this an ousia in Greek, and it's a term that's not in the Bible. And so this term popped up at the Council of Nicaea through Constantine the Emperor, uh, homo ousia, of the same substance. And when you further analyze uh, where this term came from, you find it first mentioned by the so-called Valentinian Gnostics. Um, for example, Ptolemy the Gnostic said that God always begets something of the same essence out of himself. So, <clears throat> As I analyzed these, and I want to say this again, very few isolated verses or passages that Trinitarian apologists use, it is required, according to them, to have a deeper understanding of Greek grammar in order to understand what a passage says. And <clears throat> I would like to list them for you. So it's Hebrews 10, 5 through 7. It's Philippians 2 five through nine and or extended you could say through through 11 then it's uh, John chapter 17 verse number five and the first chapter of the book of Hebrews so if you analyze those four passages um, then the task for you to do is is to figure out if they're actually saying the truth or not um, and I want to take a look at Philippians 2. I have another video that's called Kenosis Refuted. You can find that in my channel. And Kenosis means the emptying. And this comes from the word Kenao. And in Philippians 2 verse 7, they call this whole uh, passage the Carmen Christi, starting in verse 6. It says, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although, and I'm going to read it now, like James White says, it should be read, who, although he eternally existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant and by becoming in the likeness of man or by coming in the likeness of man so first of all I talked about this form of God thing before the form being the morphe which is the outer appearance now the Trinitarian apologists they have to now use this passage in order to justify what you call eternal sonship which would mean that the Son of God did not become the Son of God when he was begotten in Mary's womb but that he always existed as God the Son and that that was just a title um, because he was the son from eternity past because like I said in the beginning you have to prove that three persons existed from eternity past sharing one impersonal substance so they need to go to the New Testament and say okay well here is a passage that tells us that Jesus as the son has done something before he was conceived in the womb and so we have proven then that the son existed before his incarnation and so we made a point i mean it gets way more difficult than that because the uh, jehovah witness for example or other groups like the uh, well the arians had actually an understanding of what the jehovah witnesses today have but if you analyze these writings of the so-called church fathers you will find that people like origin also made reference to pre-existence of jesus so <clears throat> let me just briefly mention again the morphe they say it doesn't only refer to the outer appearance but also the inner substance connected to it the problem with that as i mentioned is that in mark 16 verse 12 jesus is said to have appeared in another form yeah it's it talks about a metamorphosis and um, you probably know that after the resurrection at times the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus because he appeared in a different morphe form so if you claim that the morphe is connected to the inner substance consequently that would mean that Jesus didn't just change his outer appearance to his disciples but also his inner substance so quite clearly morphe does not refer to the inner substance but only to the outer appearance now the problem they're faced with is that they need this Philippians passage because it's their main pivot point for eternal sonship. So the premise here has to be that Morphe in 2 verse 6, so who though he eternally existed in the form of God, yeah, it, it has to mean the, the substance. Yeah? If it refers to the outer appearance, then it would rather mean that Jesus, when he walked around on the earth, was in the outer appearance of God meaning he was God manifest in the flesh so God became visible in flesh like 1st Timothy 3 verse 16 says and then the whole stream of argumentation would collapse from the beginning but let's assume that the morphe refers to the inner substance first of all the eternally is not in the verse but they say well the grammar requires it yeah and um, that alone is a study in itself the way I do it is I take the word yeah existed with the same tense and then I look it up in the New Testament where else it's used and I leave that up to yourself but you come to the conclusion that it doesn't refer to something that eternally always existed in that manner um, they would then respond well but uh, you know the whole context here describes how Jesus emptied himself so it has to refer to a form that he externally existed in so kind of their argumentation goes in a circle uh, so who though he existed in the form of God did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself so this is your canal kenosis and then like James White reads it by taking on the morphe of a servant and by coming in the likeness of man the words by are not in the text either they interject them because they claim that there is a greek um grammar style here that demands the coming in the likeness of man and 
taking on the form of a servant, describing the means of the emptying. So they call this participles of means, yeah, the coming in the likeness of man and the taking on the form of a servant. They say, well, these are participles of means which explain the means of the emptying, which is an indicative. So, again, they say, well, the emptying took place by becoming in the likeness of man or coming in the likeness of man and by taking on the form of a slave. So, if you read, like in books from Ed Dock or James White, they will all refer you in footnotes to a book from Daniel Wallace, which is called Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics. So, I usually don't buy these books, but I thought, man, you really should have the quoted pages and analyze them. See what this guy is saying. So I bought one on eBay for 12 bucks, and with full expectations of a good explanation, I opened up pages 630 through 635, and I found that there is no real argumentation here, like these men claim there is. This Daniel Wallace says that uh, Philippians 2 verse 7 demands, or no, he says it actually has all the qualifications to describe participles of means. And he says because emptying is, emptying is vague, so it, uh, you know, it literally asks for being defined, like, well, emptying how? Well, by so and so forth. James White says an aorist indicative followed by aorist participles describes the means. Well, according to Wallace, first of all, that's not always the case. So there are further things that supposedly are required. And I didn't know what Wallace wrote before, so what I did is I looked up other instances of aorist indicative that have aorist participles follow it. So I found Luke 1 verse 9 and Galatians 4 verse 4. So in the back of those books, you always find an index of all the Bible verses used. And this book has many, yeah? So it goes through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and all that. And, you know, you're like, verse one, uh, 1, verse 2, 1, verse 3, blah, 1, verse 5. So I'm looking up Luke, and Luke 1, verse 9, not mentioned in the book. Like, oh, okay. Well, let's see... He probably mentions Galatians 4 verse 4. Flipping to Galatians, not in the book. Why? Why do you write a book that every one of these apologists refers to and you're not mentioning two verses that have the same style of grammar, like Philippians 2 verse 7, that prove that your theory is fake? That is not, like some people would say, poor scholarship. But that, I would say, is hiding evidence contrary to your presuppositions, right? Because Luke 1 verse 9 says that Zechariah uh, entered the temple to... Um, I can't pull up the verse out of my head right now. You'd have to read it on your own. But pretty much it proves, Galatians 4 verse 4 also, they prove that those participles don't describe a means but attributes in what condition somebody was or what happened before something took place. So Philippians 2 verse 7 actually really says that Jesus had taken the form of a servant, so the outer appearance of a servant, and had become in the likeness of man. And then when he was in that state, he emptied himself. Yeah. Um, and in verse 8 it reiterates that it says and being found in appearance as a man here it doesn't use morphe but schema yeah? being found in appearance as a man he became obedient to the death even the death on the cross so the emptying was actually the death of the on the cross and you find a parallel passage in Isaiah 53, 12, which says that God was pleased with Jesus because Jesus poured out his soul unto death. 
So that was the emptying that pleased God, and that's why he gave him the name above all names. Yeah? It's not because Jesus said, okay, God the Father, I'm going to incarnate here as God the Son, and God says, oh, well, you know, wow, you're emptying yourself here, so let me give you the name above all names because you're incarnating. You know, that's nonsense. And by the way, that is also found in Valentinian Gnosticism. That's actually a reason why some people had rejected Philippians as authoritative scripture, because they say, well, Philippians 2 teaches kenosis, which is Gnostic. But the people actually didn't understand that Philippians 2 doesn't describe an incarnation, but it describes an emptying of Jesus on the cross by pouring his soul out into death, emptying yourself, pouring it out. Now, here's another angle. He says, Wallace, in his book, the describing of means is not free from difficulty because taking on to describe emptying someone of himself is contrary. You're taking something on, describing to empty yourself, so you add, but that empties you. Well, yeah, that doesn't make sense. But then they say, well, you know, like emptying of your divine attributes, blah, 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 blah. But that's not the only problematic thing here. The second thing is that they say, coming in the likeness of man, which they think refers to the incarnation here, is not in active uh, 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 the grammar, so it's an aorist particle with, there's active voice, middle voice, and passive voice, yeah, so if you do it yourself, it's active, passive would be somebody else does it, and um, middle would mean, yeah, something in the middle, so becoming in the likeness of man is middle voice, and emptying himself is active. So now you're saying that an active action, uh, emptying himself, is qualified by a middle voice. Why wouldn't becoming in the likeness of man be active as well if it describes the means? Yeah? See, you got to think to prove these guys wrong. The second problem is that um, according to the the doctrine of uh, kenosis and the hypostatic union and the incarnation of these people Jesus did not create the body that he was walking around in yeah that was pre-created by the Holy Spirit in their dogma and that's also logical if you follow their thinking path because taking on the form of a servant so you can only take something on that pre-existed. So it's there. So Jesus, God the Son, according to this theory, looked at the womb and saw a body of flesh and bone. <laughs> so something that was the Messiah or the vehicle, like, uh, I believe it's John MacArthur who said that, or it was Spurgeon, one of the both. The vehicle by which God the Son would come to mankind. Yeah. So that vehicle was prepared there, and then he took it on. Yeah, because that's what they pull out of Hebrews 10. I don't have time to get into that now. Um, <clears throat> so follow this thought pattern then. How can you yourself empty yourself, becoming in the likeness of man, when the thing that you're taking on was made by somebody else? That would mean that taking on is also becoming the same. No, you can't become something that pre-exists. You become something by being this and then becoming that. And that's what the Bible actually teaches. It says that the Word of God became flesh, John 1.14. Now that's not supposed to happen in Gnosticism because the immaterial cannot become material because the material is essentially evil. So, you know, the flesh of Mary had to be cleansed and then only taken on without confusion of substance essence. So, God the Son always remained God the Son, and the actual Son of God was pre-made in the womb of Mary and then taken to himself. So, this whole explanation with this participle of means collapses on many levels.
Yeah, not just the one that the guy mentions in the book. He fails to mention aorist indicatives that have aorist participles follow that refute his theory. Luke 1 verse 9, Galatians 4 verse 4. Yeah, God sent forth his son, having been born of a woman, having been put under the law. That means the sending took place when Jesus was a man. So, when Jesus was 30 years old, he was sent into the public world. Right? He was a carpenter before. He entered again into the oikomene. That's what Hebrews 1 verse 6 says. Because he was known as a carpenter, got baptized, went into the desert to be tempted. And then as he re-entered the oikomene, angels were commanded to worship him. And you find that also in uh, Matthew 4 verse 11, that angels came and served him. So it's not a stretch at all to assume that they worshipped him when they came to serve him. There is no other mentioning anywhere in the Bible that connects the two only there, but it doesn't fit their theory and they cannot have Hebrews 1 verse 6 collapse, yeah, because they say, well, the angels were always worshipped, or no, when he was sent into the world, so the sending then, to them means he was sent as God the Son from heaven into the body by God the Father, and when that happened, God the Father commanded the angels to worship him, yeah, because here I am emptying myself by, you don't know, taking on this nasty thing, ugh, now I have to become this this flesh avatar. While I'm not really becoming it, I'm just taking it on. You know, it's just absurd. It is not just absurd, it is a lie. So, Hebrews 1 verse 6 collapses. Hebrews 10, 5 through 7 collapse because... Okay, entering into the world, he says, Sacrifice and burnt offerings thou wouldest not, but a body you prepared me. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. So again, this is not a pre-incarnate heavenly dialogue, because coming into the world is something that false prophets have done, First John and Second John, uh, and false spirits. Um, so it doesn't have to do with entering the universe from a heavenly plane, but simply refers to the fact that Jesus grew in wisdom, read the scriptures, and read Psalms 46 through 8, and says, hey, sacrifice and offerings, thou wouldest not, but a body, you have cut our tizzo, which means fully furnished, adjusted me. Lo, I come to do your will, O God. So also, Jesus made a conscious decision on earth as a grown man after he had become in the likeness of man because the word became flesh to subject himself under the will of the father even though he was in the outer appearance of God the more fey and thus equal to God as a man the son of God was conceived in the womb equal to the one who brought him forth. So you now had flesh and blood, a man equal to the eternal God that said, I surrender my will under yours and I'm going to offer myself on the cross. I'm going to pour out my soul unto death. And we are to mimic that. That's what Philippians 2 is about. I can't mimic, mimic uh, taking on of a different morphe. You know, like, have this mind be in you that was in God the Son. You know, okay, uh, let me do the same thing here. Let me change my, my morphe, which would mean my inner substance as well. Let me take on a different nature. Yeah? Let me uh, empty myself here. That's not true. But like I said... They are in dire need of all that to create an eternally pre-existent God the Son person. And thus they need these passages. For John 17 verse 5, I'm going to refer you to a dedicated video I have on that. Where I explain all the Greek tricks that they do there. And so, going back to the beginning, they say you need this deeper understanding. So you need to be initiated by a Gnostic priest who has all this grammar knowledge, yeah, like Wallace, who even though himself says, really my theory doesn't make much sense, but, um, you know, the 
Emptying begs for being defined. It's vague. No, it's not vague. It's defined in verse 8, and it's defined in Isaiah 53, 12, and it's defined in the whole New Testament that Jesus emptied himself on the cross. So, you pick who you want to follow. Follow lying priests and books who brag with their intellectual talk terminology or do you want to just analyze what they say and refute them and i love doing this because for my whole career i have been trying to find problems on machines and fixing them so i like to analyze stuff and fix it so there is no eternal sonship Jesus Christ existed inside the Father as the Father before because as the Father has given in creation to all human beings his image yeah so we are made in the image of God you have an inner reflection of yourself are you two persons yeah when you talk to yourself is that uh, you know the same essence of Andre but it's my second person and then my spirit that drives all that is that the third person in my being? That is just stupid. It is wrong, right? And it's because Platonism was mixed with the Bible by the Nicolaitans, like Origen, uh, Ignatius of Antioch, Irenaeus of Lyon, uh, you know, like all these people, they have subdued the laity, the people of God, made themselves the clergy, came up with the dogma, say, you burn in hell if you don't believe in eternal sonship. Well, we'll see what God will say in the end to that.